Okay, hi, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the SIM Online Masterclass Series, Season 4. The topic for today is towards post-pandemic supply chains. Please note that this session, as per mentioned, will be recorded and we will upload the recording to the SIM YouTube channel one week after this session ends. So just a gentle reminder, if you do have any questions along the way, please feel free to type your questions in the chat below. Our speaker and staff will assist to answer your questions, and there will be a short briefing for the Masters of Science in Supply Chain and Logistic Management program after the masterclass. So first, let me introduce the speaker for today. Dr. Liu is a Principal Teaching Fellow at WMG, University of Warwick. He received his PhD in Manufacturing Technology from Shanghai Jiao Tong University in 1987, and later an MBA from Birmingham University. Dr. Liu was a recipient of a number of prestigious fellowships, including British Council uh, Postdoctoral Fellowship, a Rockwell Research Fellowship, and the RAE, the Royal Academy of Engineering Industrial Secondment Award. So without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Liu. Dr. Liu, over to you. Okay. <clears throat> good afternoon or good morning, whatever. Uh, uh, good evening. <laughs> okay, uh, let's start. Now, today I'm going to present a masterclass in the topic of towards the post-pandemic supply chain. Uh, the key topics that I'm going to cover is, first of all, the pandemic and unprecedented challenges, and in which I'm going to be talking about the supply chain resilience, risk aversion, and the mitigations. And secondly, I will move on to the supply chain reconfiguration and how the supply chain is going to reconfigure after the pandemic. Obviously, this is not going to be purely impacted upon by the pandemic. It will be also impacted upon by many other factors to which I'm sure everybody understand what I mean. There are wars going on at the moment, and there are also <clears throat> political agenda in the major countries around the world, which predominantly uh, influences the supply chain development. And then I'm going to be uh, briefly exper uh, uh, to talk about the what are we going to expect after the pandemic. Okay, so uh, just to, to make it clear that the ob objective of this uh, uh, masterclass is not a, a, a didactic. It is going to be a exploratory discussions. I perhaps raise questions more than I have actually give the solutions. Okay, so first, the pandemic and unprecedented challenges to the supply chain resilience. We all know, first of all, what a supply chain is in a very general understanding before we actually get started. I know 99% of students have no problem with this term, but just in case, okay, what we are talking about is a group of organizations linked together by the material flow, by the information flow, finance flow, and the commercial flow to deliver the goods and the services to the end consumer. And those organizations linked together, we call it the supply chain. And those supply chain in today's scenario are largely global. Very few supply chains are actually defined, actually operated within a local region. Okay. So that is how we really get started. Now, Pandemic is what we are now experiencing now. It is still not ending yet. There are a lot of questions <clears throat> unanswered so far, but there are some immediate impact uh, that uh, I think we can really foresee, which will be directly related with how the supply chain manager is going to consider their reactions, their future strategies, and how to face up to those challenges. Okay. Obviously, the first thing is the global tourism industry has been badly hit. We all experienced that. I used to come down 
to Singapore to teach every year. And uh, I have not been to Singapore for more than two years now. <clears throat> Health services sector uh, overloaded, some even incapacitated due to the number of the infections. Normal health service availability standard okay, is significantly worsened. Global logistics, due to various other reasons, restrictions and so on, suffered a catastrophic setback. And we will see some data on that. <clears throat> Unemployment rises, inflation rises, and above all, perhaps the most important thing is over 6 million human lives have already lost and are still counting. And that is very serious. And then now the question is, are we talking about the politics or are we talking about the supply chain? So we need to make it clear that in fact, the supply chain management topics, okay, is closely related to what we call the, the ecosystems in which whether it is a health problem, political problems, military problems, will all be involved uh, in the whole system. And that is why that uh, we bring those two uh, things together. Uh, one is the pandemic, the other one is the supply chain. So why in theory they are connected? And I'm going to very briefly to talk about the five key natures of the global supply chain. As I said, the supply chains are largely global. There will be one way or the other connected to the world. First, it is a ubiquitous. It is everywhere. Everything you see, touch comes from a supply chain. It is indispensable. There is no alternative to supply chain. You can't create another system and stop the supply chain as we define it today. There is a specialization and a coordination nature across all supply chains. Each individual organization is no longer be able to deliver everything technically, capability-wise or whatever for the consumer. They have to collaborate, connect it, with other organization in the supply chain to coordinate together. Uh, so there is a specialization and coordination. This is what Adam Smith said, the div division of labor or international division of labor. Okay. There is also a heterogeneous nature of uh, supply chain. No supply chain, no two supply chain are exactly the same. Uh, they are all different and uh, this is a why that uh, we find that when we treat with each individual supply chain, we have to put a pinch of salt and then looking at the particular circumstances, considering um, the theory of contingencies and also many different factors for a specific condition. That is another thing. And it's permeating uh, around the world in all sorts of issues looking at Brexit, looking at, uh, you know, Ukraine wars and whatever, supply chain is involved. It is almost impossible to find anywhere that supply chain is not involved. In fact, a great deal of discussion today uh, in the news is about the breaking down of some supply chains, and the creating and the moving and the changing of others. Global economy is con con constitute of and rest upon the global supply chains. So that is why that the many of the data that we see seemingly on the global economy, in fact, reflect exactly what happens in the global supply chains. For example, with the pandemic at the country level, the trade has been declining. There is a trade losses. The reddish color, the regions are the negative, okay? Or the, there is a negative uh, development during the pandemic and some are very serious. And uh, we also notice that uh, the trade losses on the uh, uh, port level, uh, 
we know the logistics, yes, just as a background of the uh, knowledge. Logistics in our course are defined as timely allocation of resources. And uh, a great deal of uh, moving and the relocation of resources are through the sea uh, container transportations. And those transportation uses a port. That is what we're talking about. Now, if you're looking at the details of those ports, and you will see the changes, and they may be up to two thirds of down uh, different port. Uh, there's none of them that are actually increasing. Uh, so this is what we meant by the supply chain has been hit. Okay, not just the economy. In fact, the direct hit is the supply chain, then forward to the impact on the global economy. The largest uh, relative trade losses on a country level is also very significant. Across this table, you can see uh, many different countries, 20 different countries, and uh, uh, there are a great deal of uh, one third uh, one fifth of what we call the, the trade losses. Obviously, these figures are dynamic. Okay, if today you're looking at it, it may be even more uh, serious, and some of them may be getting better for various of different reasons. It's simply, the pandemic is not finished yet. Okay, now there are some researches, there are some reports in the literature, and one of them I actually quoted here. <clears throat> It is a research paper. This paper examines the effect of COVID-19 pandemic on the global economics activity and uh, you know, uh, the stock market and the energy sectors considering the sizable damage impact, damaging impact on those crucial aspects. Okay. Uh, the findings, on the stock market is more sensitive uh, to the COVID-19 pandemic than the real economy because people are much more emotional. And, you know, as uh, Greenspan said, irrational exuberance happens a lot more in the stock market than in other sectors. There is a dwindling power of uh, consumptions caused by the COVID-19, which will be a major problem for the economic growth. And, and also taking preventive measure against the health crisis uh, to save the economy becomes a major problem. We can also see many other figures published. Uh, there are some sources of where this figure, they are not the latest. And uh, we are just getting into the 2022, the figures will continue to develop. But the major impact appears to be during the 2020, uh, when the trade volumes, uh, the deep dip, uh, whether it's uh, export and import around, around the globe. And also we realized, okay, the recovery time of the countries and uh, you know predicted is not going to be immediate after the pandemic. The, it predicted in 2021, not now. I think now it's going to be even worse. OECD countries will be recovery uh, uh, from the you know the pandemic in next year rather than this year. But I think this will be even, even worse if we are going to predict today. Okay, so this is a, a last year's uh, predictions. It's a major problem. It's a major problem related to the supply chain. Why the country cannot recover? Because the supply chain cannot recover. Why supply chain cannot recover? Because the supply chain has been hit by the pandemic as the realization of the risks. When the risk hit, there are a few stages of development. The stage that we try to get into is what we call the recovery. And the lens of the recovery indicates the resilience 
of the supply chain. And different supply chain, different countries has a different resilience. And this is the key that I'm going to explore a little later after a few slides. You know, how do we really manage the resilience and so on? Okay. Uh, here is the uh, annual uh, foreign direct investment inflow uh, by the major country groups. As you perhaps can see, the main one is the blue one and the, the yellow one, uh, talking about developed economies and the developing countries. In 2020, they are all going down and the developed economies are going down much deeper than developing countries in average. Okay, but still the, they are very serious negative effect. And uh, also we can look in at the crude oil price. The crude oil price here demonstrates from 2020 to 2021 and uh, the earlier 2000, there is a huge dip of the price and we have uh, perhaps remembered that uh, once the price was was very low, uh, even you know hypothetically it dropped uh, into minus, which uh, realistically did not happen. But that is uh, the record of the price. Price now is very high, much higher than the average, or much higher than what people would expect. And this is also uh, the, the, the uh, closing price of the crude oil in the US, uh, in US dollars per barrel. As, as you can see, there is a dip in 2020, and then there's a going uh, peak uh, uh, getting into 2022. Okay. But however, does that mean that our demand is reducing? In fact, although the tourism industry reduces, the airline industry had a bad hit, but however, the overall demand for crude oil as an energy source is increasing, okay, is, is, is increasing. And uh, if you're looking at the GDP across different countries, for example, looking at just the UK's GDP, which is also uh, a key factor, demonstrating that it's been hit. Uh, hit in 2008 and 2009, uh, economic crisis. Then it is a period of normal growth, which happens to most of the countries. Now, when the pandemic come, the, sh the, 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 the impact is a huge shock. Uh, this is a, one of the problems that uh, <clears throat> we said that it hits the whole a global supply chain and therefore on the country's economy for developing country as well as for developing countries. So there are a report, for example, this is American's uh, Congressional Research Service indicated even more serious problem, not about the economy, but about the people. Okay. Some estimated est estimates indicate that uh, 65 million to 75 million people may have entered into the extreme poverty due to the pandemic. So here are a few exploratory questions after we have understand that, is how do we do in our supply chain? How to face up to the challenge? How to survive the pandemic? Uh, is it a risk or certainty and how to measure the strengths of the supply chain and how do we do it? Okay. So this is what I'm going to uh, explain and discuss with you together uh, next. <clears throat> I would say in the end, it is all about supply chain resilience. After pandemic, the key is to supply chain uh, to bounce back to the normal circumstances performance as well as perhaps even uh, getting better. There are a great deal of complexity and a dynamism to foresee, and we will talk a few of them. Uh, there are selected topic. I'm not gonna be very comprehensively to talk about all of these. First, in terms of uh, 
the conceptual definition, this is one of the slides we teach. Now we are focusing on certainty and uncertainty, desirability and undesirability. We define risk as a uncertain and undesirable, okay? Whereas the other things are defined at the different quadrants in relating to the two dimensional observation spaces, okay? So all risks are undesirable, we don't like it. All risks are uncertain. If it is a certain and undesirable, we call it failure. If it is a, 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 a certain that it is a desirable, we call it success. Uncertain and desirable would be called a luck. So what we are talking about is supply chain management and how to do that under the, uh, the post-pandemic era. So there are further questions we are going to talk about. Such as, you know, uh, not all the risks are the same. And how do we really know the severity of the risk? How do we really manage it? So briefly, I would just let you know that in our course, we address this type of a problem uh, very briefly. There is a one tool called the profiling tool. With the profiling tool, we will be able to prioritize them. It's called the prioritization tool. And there's another bunch of tool is the managerial tool, which is much easier, less academic, indicating considering the likelihood and impact of all the risks and how to manage them, okay. Now, how that uh, academic concept is related with the post-pandemic and uh, pandemic uh, risks. Uh, so I would say there are a number of things we can use to understand it a little better. First, you may have already heard uh, black swan risk, any event that it is deviating beyond what is normally expected is called the black swan risk. There is another risk you may have already heard, especially when you read the newspaper articles in the beginning of the year, people often say, you know, there is a gray rhino risk this year to come. It is something highly probable, high impact, yet neglected threat. And that is called the gray rhino risks. And the gray rhino risks uh, is more serious. Uh, example of that is 1929, the Black Monday stock uh, price crash crashes. Okay, that would be one of the example. Why? Because before that, people has already predicted that is going to be a serious impact and uh, the risk is almost certainly will be realized. The probability is very high, impact is very high, and yet people choose to ignore them. And that is why, of course, a very serious crash as well as a 10 years of recession. So here we go. If we use those tools, we find pandemic is very much the gray rhino risk and uh, not really black swan risk. Why? Because the likelihood is so different, okay? The gray rhino risk is high uh, uh, abilities and, uh, and uh, the black swan is a low probability. We know I'm not talking about the politics. There is a one country in the world, okay? I don't name it to avoid any political issues. And they knew the gray rhino risk, they knew it's going to be serious, but they choose to ignore them. And yet what happened to them is that they become the most seriously affected. The death rate is highest, the number of people who died due to the pandemic is the highest. Uh, infection rate is also highest in the world, okay? This is what we mean, uh, the, the risk. So when I talking about these issues with the pandemic and with the supply chain, the key idea is about risk mitigation and the resilience. How do we do that? Let me show you that in general, researchers has already long find there are four stages of risk uh, impact and on the, on the performance of the supply chain. 
here there is a normal performance level. When the risk hit the supply chain, it will have initial impact. The performance gets lower. And then there will be a following up impact. It's getting deeper, it's called full impact. Then goes to the recovery period, and then there will be a long-term impact period. What we are now, perhaps in terms of a pandemic on supply chain, is perhaps during this period. Uh, this is my personal guess, as things can change, we do not really know for sure. Okay, now what is this? This is the duration of recovery. It is the measure of strength of the supply chain. This is what we pursue. This is what the post-pandemic supply chain management should pursue. If we can achieve a good uh, resilience, which means reducing the period of recovery, and we will enjoy a lot more uh, our life uh, economically, as well as uh, other aspects. Right. So. What can we do in order to improve the supply chain resilience? There are a number of things, operational wise, structure wise, and so on. So I'm not gonna cover every aspect of how that is gonna be managed. I just quickly to go through a number of things that you can see, we can see together, is a structure change. Supply chain needs to reconfigure after the pandemic. You know, there are sectors, it's so obvious, health sector structure needs to be reconfigured to, you know, prevent this kind of serious impact to take place, to reduce the severity of the, of the impact. Uh, catering, tourism services, supply chains will change. Military supply chain today is changing. High tech supply chain due to the global politics is already seriously changing. Energy supply chain also, just these days while we are talking, is changing now. We know the gas supply, crude oil supply, supply chain in the world is now going through a major reshuffle. Okay. So theoretically on our uh, subject, we going down to one thing, it's called the vertical integration. I'm uh, not going down to teach you this subject, but just to let you know that the supply chain manager after the pandemic is going down to looking at the vertical integration a lot more than other things such as outsourcing. Why? Because vertical integration give the OEM, give the owner of the, of the key leading organization in the supply chain the control. And therefore with that control, they will be able to recover. They will be able to reduce the duration of the recover, improve their, what we call the, the supply chain resilience. And you know what? This reconfiguration, uh, whether it's a downward vertical integration or upward vertical integration is a structure change. Okay, that is the one of the key topics that I would anticipate is going to take place in post pandemic supply chain. Okay. Another thing is perhaps the capacity rebalancing and uh, bottleneck issues, okay? That is just uh, uh, a few things that we have time to talk about. There are many other things we can talk. Okay? Uh, in terms of capacity, since this is just a, a masterclass, uh, many of the participants have not attended our modules. We know that the capacity for a organization is the number of the units that they can produce in the unit of time per month or per year. Okay. However, the supply chain's capacity is not equal to the company's uh, production unit per unit of time nor it is equal to the average nor it is equal to the maximum nor it is equal to the adding them together. It is in fact equal to the minimum capacity of the entire uh, supply chain. Whichever the link or the ring in the supply chain, okay, whichever one you prefer to call it, <coughs> holds the smallest capacity is the key because that restricts the whole capacities, uh, whole 
supply chain capacity. When the pandemic hit, you know what? The minimum capacitated organization in the supply chain arises. In the past, they were okay. They were not the problem, but now they become the problem. This is why we hear the far cries in every almost industrial sectors for the supply chains breaking down. How do we really manage them? Okay, we looking at the bottleneck, the supply chains bottleneck. Obviously that is a following this concept. Whichever link in the supply chain has the lowest capacity uh, and uh, they will become the bottleneck. Supply chain manager after the pandemic is to be able to identify and focus on those bottlenecks. It is a theory based, it's called the theory of constraint. Those constraints is the key for the supply chain manager to focus. Why? Because only by focusing on the constrained link in the supply chain can the supply chain manager to achieve the most effective resilience. Otherwise, you would be wasting your resources too much that don't see a lot of performance improvement. Another thing as a, a selected topic that we can cover and uh, we should talk about is again, the harnessing of innovation and technology, because this is not purely uh, from the pandemic. Before the pandemic, innovative technology is already uh, rising in the area of supply chain management. Things like Internet of Things, cloud computing, blockchain technologies, and you name it, there's a great deal of uh, supply chain related technology uh, develops. Now, to me, this becomes even more serious after the pandemic impact. Okay. And uh, uh, without it, we were still doing it. So that trend will not really buckle. That trend continues. But with the pandemic, we see there is a need. Uh, Microsoft CEO says, this is just a quote, uh, we have seen two years worth of the digital transformations that transformation during the two years of a pandemic <laughs> in two months. And uh, uh, oh, he, he basically means the two months is within the pandemic. Two months uh, from remote uh, team working and learning to sales and the customer services and so on. And today we are doing the online uh, masterclass, which is the transformation. Uh, transformation of the, using the technology. And there are many other things uh, happening. So I'm not going through, but I can raise a few questions for all to think about, which lead to uh, us to understand how important that supply chain management needs to change in order to deal with uh, the pandemic and face up to the challenges in the post-pandemic. Data not digitization has been realized by the researchers is the key. Many people were carried away too much by the digitization, do the you know, systems, the technologies on uh, treating the data, but without looking at the validity, truthfulness, the usefulness of the data and so on. In the past, the supply chain looks at very much just in time. Everything is about just in time because efficiency, smoothness, collaboration, low cost is all about just that. But today, supply chain, not today, after the pandemic, I think we need to really look into just in case, uh, a lot more than that. A rising, you know, uh, work uh, safety issues in terms of health safety will become uh, one of the things that uh, we need to consider. Uh, the digital first, uh, perhaps will be moved uh, towards what we call the, the data clarity first. And this is the issue I have not expanded, but I just to let you know, the digitization should not be uh, exaggerated too much after the pandemic. A lot of research will go down towards the data issue. In the next topic of uh, clouding, uh, cloud 
uh, moving supply chain to the cloud. Also, uh, the researchers, the paper reference here, also talk about. They said that the digitization, cloud computing, they cannot deliver the agility. So what can we do? It is about the data. Uh, the da data, where it comes from, how accurate, how relevant, is more of an issue after the pandemic. Okay. So go to cloud is not uh, precisely exactly what we needed. Of course, we may need it, but the key things is to make sure that we get the right data to uh, analyze and to have the right data that is relevant. And also the paper raised many uh, risk issues, uh, risk issues when we go in use to, uh, when we go in to use the uh, high tech digitizations, cloud computings and, and, and so on, okay. So here we go. I would like to quickly, since the time is now up, I'm going to quickly to say that there is a, another area that I must mention is the supply chain sustainability and environmental impact. This is similar to the digitization. It may not really change after the impact of a pandemic with or without pandemic sustainability will be the issue. But during the pandemic, you all remember we had a COP26 conference in Glasgow looking at the global sustainability issues. And uh, I would like to say how that issue is related with our supply chain manager, because this issue is going through the resilience. Supply chain resilience measures the sustainability. Supply chain resilience is a tangible institutionalization institu uh, of the sustainability. Okay. And uh, there we go. Though I would summarize that uh, there are a number of post pandemic strategy drivers that today's supply chain manager is going to focus okay, for, for. First, of course, continue. Innovation and digitization will still be the key strategic drivers. The blockchain, internet of things, artificial intelligence, cloud computing will play ever more important roles. We still raise on that. Risk aversion and the supply chain resilience will become a lot more important, high up in the management agenda, high prioritization in our all tasks. And then finally, as we have just said, the greener supply chain is still the major issue for the long-term sustainability of our global supply chain. Okay, I hope I've not delayed too much, Ash, and then I am quite happy to take questions. Hi, thank, thank you, Dr. Lu. That was such an insightful sharing. It could not have been more relevant, especially with the current supply chain climate. So everyone, uh, if there's any questions, please feel free to type it in the chat and Dr. Lu will be able to answer them accordingly. Thank you. So let's see if I uh, uh, end the show. So I should be able to see the panel. Okay, I think... It's been, I think the masterclass was very clear and straightforward. And I think because you have explained it really well, I think that's why there's no questions coming in from this, okay. uh, yeah, this participants. Uh, okay. Oh, okay. Uh, we do have okay, one question. A, that just came one. In. All right. Mm. Okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah, there are a number of uh, questions. Uh, uh, okay. Good evening, everyone. Okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, you, 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 uh, I'll read the questions the to question. me. Me. All yes, right. Thank you. No problem. So, okay, we have received one question. Uh, I'm not so sure if, let's say, you will be able to answer this one. Um, they say she's asking, uh, assuming the war comes to a truce, how long do we expect the supply chain to achieve equilibrium? Well, uh, first of all, that uh, we know uh, the war come to truce is still uncertain. Suppose it comes to truce now. How long? 
that the supply chain is going to achieve the equilibrium is indeed a questions rather than a defined data somewhere. For my uh, presentation, I think I have talked about the resilience. This is precisely the answer. What is the period, which is a stage three, the recovery period, which you can reach the equilibriums, and that we really honestly do not know. We do not really know. There are there is one slide which basically try to answer that question to say, oh, certain countries, OECD countries, maybe uh, 2023, they will reach equilibrium. But uh, um, the recent data I heard is going to be 2024 for most of the global supply chain uh, to reach equilibrium. There is a major structure changes, operational level changes, and uh, bear in mind, it is not only uh, affected by the war, it is also affected by the Americans, uh, you know, uh, strategies towards the globe and many other countries' strategies towards whatever globe. I'm not gonna get into the politics, but you know what I mean. So the war is one factor and uh, pandemic is one factor. And how supply chain is going to achieve equilibrium would be certainly impacted by all these factors. And hence, it's very difficult to predict. I hope that 2023, 2024 will achieve equilibrium. That's only a hope rather than the answer. <laughs> okay. All right, thank you so much as well. All right, uh, so if let's say while everyone is typing out their questions, you can feel free to type in them out along the way as long uh, when it comes to mine. Uh, without further ado, maybe I hand over back to Dr. Liu for a quick briefing on the Masters of Science in the Supply Chain and okay. Logistic Management Program. Okay, thank you, Ash. And uh, okay. let me share the slides. Um, <coughs> this one. Oops. Uh, this. Mm -hmm. Right, okay. Uh, Ash, am I showing the slides already? Um, no, I, I think you need to change it over. Yeah, so I think you... Uh, have, have you seen the slide the... now? Oh, still, uh, still the one, okay. It's still the master's so I class think, uh, I think change over, all right, okay. Thank you for reminding me to change that over, sharing. Okay. Uh, uh, Ash, try again. Yep. Is that, uh, is that showing? Okay, right, all right, all good. Right, let's uh, start it, everyone. Uh, I have been trusted to give this presentation for the program briefing. And uh, in fact, the credit of preparing that goes down to the same tech and uh, uh, the, the team uh, that have given me this. So. I will go through that as the first step. If something that I have not said clearly, uh, please do uh, uh, correct me. And also, again, you know, it's based on the questions. Okay, so I will try to answer questions from what I understand. Okay, so let's start. Uh, the WMG, uh, University of Warwick, and uh, SimTech and the Global Educations in Singapore have created this Master of Science postgraduate uh, program. And that program basically consists of the four different courses, engineering business management, supply chain and the logistics management, and programming program and the project management, cybersecurity management, those are the four courses, okay. 
uh, between the two parties we collaborated and that has been actually already uh, running now the uh, partnership okay and uh, their role as uh, partly presented here uh, from WMG University of Warwick uh, uh, we provide accreditations for the qualification uh, we provide the tutors uh, will fly into Singapore to deliver each module if it is a normal time at the moment we still deliver the module online and uh, guest speakers all modules I believe have guest speakers from the local industry uh, in the relevant subject will contribute to the module okay but it is invited and uh, uh, will share local insight into the subject. And also the, the nature or the characteristics of our course is combine the academic rigor with the industrial relevance. Uh, that's the key, okay. And here we have the two courses that's Master Science in Engineering Business Management, we simply call it EBM and also SCLM, the two courses. The courses will have a project or dissertation for students to write in the end and to pass uh, through examination. That would be supported by A-Star, SimTech, uh, as well as also by the Sim uh, Global Education. But the other two courses will be uh, similar, except that it is not, uh, in terms of dissertation, is not directly supported by SIM tech, but by the SIM global education. Okay. So why WMG in Warwick from the SIM tech point of view? I think there are many reasons uh, we do that. First of all, is our Warwick University and the WMG's achievement. Uh, uh, we are the Europe's most outstanding examples of how a university should interact with the industry. And also, we are one of the world's top 20 most international universities, ranked 20th overall, and 10th. Uh, top 10 in the UK. And uh, based on the QS World Survey, uh, we are ranked 61 first, 61st in the world. And uh, also here is the link for the top 10 for highest earnings. Now this is not the highest earnings for professors, uh, from the university. It is the highest earnings for those graduate from our courses, okay? Uh, from the University of Warwick. And, okay. So that is what they mean. It's a student. Uh, eventually they, 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 they get a job, but they have higher earnings. And they're ranked uh, six in the UK league timetable in 2022 from the Guardian. And continue, uh, there is a high level of industrial engagement in WMG in particular. There are other departments that also have a good level of engagement. So our motto is to combine academic excellence with industrial experience. Academic programs are developed with the industries to address their needs. Uh, now, I just want to add in, I myself has been uh, in WMG for more than 33 years. I have witnessed how WMG's module were developed uh, and supported by industry. Those modules you are taking, those modules we are teaching now, is the inherited module uh, that uh, developed in the early 1980s and then in the 1990s where we 
deliver those modules to the industrialist. And this is why we involve in companies and their managers in structuring, designing, contributing to the module. And those features are still uh, with us today. Uh, curriculums are developed with the industrialist and also industry research development uh, feed into the teachings and so on. So these are one of the key reasons why I think SimTech uh, uh, collaborated with WMG in Warwick. Okay. Now, of course, another reason is the student's career and future employability. Uh, there are a number of uh, uh, courses, and here are few uh, potential future employment area and the companies. I'm not going to go through those companies. Okay, CSM is uh, cyber security management. Their graduates would be perhaps finding good careers in those security technology teams, become a consultant, information critical organizations and so on in Singapore and many countries, okay. And also supply chain logistic management graduates will become the specialist in the purchasing planning and also uh, operations management area. And the EDM graduates basically looking into uh, management positions in manufacturing service organizations and, uh, and so on. And also PPM, project management uh, graduate would be getting jobs uh, in management ranks for project managers and so on, okay. Big companies such as Tata, PwCs, and so on. Okay, so those are uh, reasons why that the collaboration taking place. Now I'm going down to some of the details in terms of the, you know, program structures, recruiting, recruitment, uh, um, requirement, and so on. So here we have part time, full time. Okay. For part-time program, we have six intakes uh, in January, March, May, July, September, November, uh, except that uh, uh, cybersecurity CSM uh, will start from July this year. For the full-time master program, uh, there are two intakes, uh, two intakes, and uh, uh, that is April and uh, October. Okay, uh, for the uh, uh, full time for PPM, it only takes one, okay, for whatever particular reasons, there's only one intake. The program will be delivered by university, Warwick University's academics, uh, surely uh, very much supported by SimTech and the Global Education uh, they are delivered to the same standard uh, to the, the whatever delivered in the UK. Uh, we don't even change the material. So you, you receive the same material, same teacher, teaching uh, quality standard uh, whatsoever. Uh, so they are the same standard delivery. <clears throat> they are all uh, in the modular delivery compare with undergraduate semester delivery, uh, where the lecturing activity uh, will be spread across the entire terms or, or semesters, uh, but it is module. Modules are usually uh, intensive within one week. Uh, later, I'm gonna show you, uh, there are slides talking about modules. Assessment or, you know, uh, the post-module work is basically how the modules are assessed. So the assessment is based on basically two things. One is each module will have a post-module work assessment. Some will have an in-module combined with a small uh, percentage, okay? And the plus the project examination uh, assessment. So basically you have to pass eight or nine modules and then 
a project. Both are assessed. Okay. So dissertation, uh, which is uh, talking about a project. For the 10 cats module, so far we are delivering the 10 cats modules. This is an academic system. Okay. Uh, uh, the, the dissertation is a 90 credit. Okay. And uh, uh, the nine modules uh, consists of a 90 credit. And uh, each module is 10 credit. This is what I said, the 10 credit systems. And uh, we are uh, soon going to have a 15 credit system, which means that we will have eight modules, each takes 15 credit. So heavier in terms of academic uh, proportion, credit proportions. And uh, in that case, uh, we will have 60 credit uh, for the dissertation instead of 90. And that for a direct implication, even if you don't know what those credit is all about, you know, I find it confusing too. Uh, but the direct implication is you're going to have in the 15 cat system soon, we'll have eight modules, more heavier modules, and lighter uh, dissertation, which is only 10,000 words instead of 20,000 words. Okay. Right. Uh, teaching style and uh, our teaching styles are uh, different from most of the undergraduate teaching across the world. So they are more interactive uh, lecturing, team group working is an uh, indispensable part uh, throughout the week. You always get it, okay? Okay, various in terms of how much of it across different modules. Case study is always there. Uh, for example, in my module, you have uh, cases in almost every single lecture. Not necessary, you have to do it. There are many case studies are delivered to tell you the stories, okay? but it is an indispensable part. Uh, uh, deliver from both academic and industrial presenters. Now for the Singapore delivery, mostly is done by academics uh, from the UK. The, the speakers for the, from the local will deliver the industrial presenters. Having said that, <clears throat> having said that, the academics from the UK has already been uh, uh, inferenced and uh, also, you know, considered in terms of the contents uh, from the industrial uh, areas. Uh, for example, case studies, activities, and even the contents of the lectures are very much focused on serving the real world industries. Each module is supported by an online material. Uh, we have a Moodle systems, and now when it's delivered online, there's also a team system materials. Okay. So for the uh, teaching method wise, EBM, SCRM, and the PPM, they are 10 credit modules. Okay. So it's a five day delivery for full-time mode and uh, uh, two weekend plus evenings for part-time mode. So still one week delivery. And there are combination of lectures, case studies and so on. Group size between 25 to 35, exactly the same as what happens in the UK. And it's going to be assessed by the written assignment. We call it a post-module assignment and possibly some in-module assessment, which will not exceed 30% sometimes 15, 20%, okay. And, and uh, for the 15 cats modules, still would be delivered within five days for the full-time mode for one module, uh, consecutive days, or two weekends and evenings in one week, okay. However, there is an online learning material added, and this is why 
uh, there is a more academic content for the 15 credit modules. Okay. And uh, the other ones are very similar com combination of lecture, case studies, group activities, group size 25 to 35, and assessed by a written assignment. And uh, that uh, written assignment constitute 100 hours. This is your management, okay? We will not check the uh, minute you sit on your desk. Uh, some modules may have an in-module element, okay? And then there are also some more detailed time uh, for our delivery mode. For example, the full-time module, five days, Monday to Friday, nine to six. And by the way, by Friday, we may let students leave a little early on a good will uh, <laughs> nature. Okay. So uh, full-time module via online delivery will be shifted towards evening due to the time difference between the UK and the Singapore. At the moment, I think it's a seven hour differences. Part-time module, if it is a face-to-face, -face, uh, it's a weekend mode. So you can see it's a full day for Saturday, Sunday, and then Saturday, and you have a four evenings during the weekdays. Okay. And also during the uh, COVID-19 period, and now we're still in uh, the part-time mode, time uh, for the weekend will be shifted towards evening to overcome the time differences problem. Right, tuition fee, well, I would find it very surprisingly cheap and excellent. It's, you know, we are talking about most of students is uh, for the local student and international student, for the uh, masters in EBM, SCRM, and the PPM, okay? These are the fees. It's only 35,149 Singapore dollar and 50 cents. Very cheap, very, very low priced, I think. Attractive, very good. And the other ones, you can have a look. And that, I don't think everybody, anybody can change that. It's decided by university level. Right, so I'm not going to talk about that too much. <clears throat> How the benefit are delivered, okay? Uh, we have mentioned a few things already. I think the key benefit is the, you know, the learning you gain because we have academic excellence and industrial uh, relevance. And uh, we have a long years of experience of developing and delivering those modules. So, you are in safe hands. I think that's the key uh, benefit you uh, if you attend our uh, courses. Okay, so, and also there are some research and development uh, materials. We uh, put them into the teaching. Okay, as you can see, some uh, recently published articles will be in our teaching materials. And you will see recent cases. For example, in my module, we have cases from Tesla. We have cases from Huawei supply chains, okay? Now the practitioner delivery uh, uh, in the UK certainly is more than in Singapore because we have a convenience of inviting local speakers without incurring any logistic problems. If we are going to bring all the speakers into Singapore, uh, each module may need to have uh, five people fly into the Singapore, which can cause some logistic problems. Okay, so slightly less, but you still have it. Global experience and the input are certainly there. And our courses are always uh, not only uh, designed, delivered with a global knowledge in mind, uh, but also it is always assessed and the benchmark, the quality assessed against whatever uh, similar courses around the globe. And we are already in the last two years going through the reviews and improvement of our course design and the module designs. 
and in the future we will still continue to do that. Okay. And the assignment is also real business related. That is what we call the practical rather than pure academic. So you, we don't have a model answers, for example, for, for my uh, modules PMA. Okay, that is what we mean more practical. Students are very welcome to use their own uh, practical uh, issues, project uh, to uh, discuss about, okay, uh, for their project, for their PMAs as well, if they like. Okay. Now, the student's commitment for the master program for those three courses, I think it's very simple. We put it simply, you attend the modules, nine modules and nine assignment, as well as second part, that is dissertation. Okay, you're doing the dissertation, we call it execution. You deliver the dissertation submissions and you have to go through an oral examination. But during the pandemic period, uh, we in the UK have stopped oral examination I am not quite sure whether we, after pandemic, we will resume that or not, but it's, a, it's, a, it's a just a, a contingency measures. Okay, but yes, two components, modules and dissertation. Right. Uh, we also offer as a whole system, although most of the students are not interested in looking at PGA, PGA is Postgraduate award is a lesser award, less credited or less recognized around the world. But the master degree uh, is well uh, recognized and uh, globally understood what they mean. But the PGAs are lesser degree. Okay? But if somebody wants to do that, we have this in it. You do three modules, three assignments, and then uh, uh, for the uh, student's uh, commitment for the MSc program for the cybersecurity management, <laughs> there's a slight differences because they have already moved down to 15 credit. So it's eight modules, eight assignments plus project. Okay. Now for the cybersecurity management, Postgraduate award, you need to do two modules only, uh, two assignments, uh, of course, plus pre learning. For the 10 credit course, you do three modules for the PGA, and no pre learning activities. Okay. Some informal pre learning activities still there, it's not a formal. Okay. So in the end, I'm sure that most of our students will be very successful and they will achieve a master degree certificate just like this uh, from uh, University of Warwick. Okay, so here is a sample uh, certificate. It has the signature of Warwick University's vice chancellor and the registrar. Okay. The only difference is, is your name will be printed on that. Right, entry requirement. Now for the four program, we have the same entry requirement except the last bit. There's a little bit IT requirement for the cybersecurity. Okay. Uh, the first thing for most people is the bachelor's degree. UK up second class on a degree or its equivalent. Uh, uh, if you have not got the up, if you got the lower second class on a degree and its equivalent, then you need to have two years of relevant working experience in the area that you are going to study. Uh, or successful completion of WMG's relevant postgraduate award program, because that award, as I said, it was a lesser degree than the master. So you get into the step uh, into 
getting the award and then get yourself an uh, entry level into the master afterwards if you have already got the postgraduate award. And then, or successful completion of the SIM, uh, SIMTEX graduate, graduate diploma program uh, if you don't have a UK uh, the, or equivalent uh, bachelor degrees, then you can also uh, join our. <clears throat> For matured candidate, we mean by those managers who have many years of a working experience but don't have a bachelor degree, don't have a diploma, don't have a postgraduate award, you can also apply, uh, provided if you have how many years? Uh, was it 10 years? Yeah, okay. Uh, eight years of relevant work experience. Okay. If you are 30 years older or, or, or older and uh, uh, had eight years of relevant working experience. Okay. <clears throat> Candidate with other qualification, if you have, then we can look at it individually and discuss that. And also additional requirement for the cyber security management course is that you need to have a background in IT. You need to demonstrate you are familiar with the subject. Right. And I'm not going to talk about a full entry before October because those are already on the website. <clears throat> now, the postgraduate award entry, uh, if you are aiming for that, less people for that, most people for, post, for, the, for the master degree, then obviously we also provide those level, which is a lower, as you can see. Uh, qualification equivalent to the UK bachelor's degree, uh, does not say it has to be up or whatever, so long as it's a bachelor degree. And the matured candidate, uh, you need to have how many years? It's still eight years, yes, yes. And candidates with other qualification can be and also for the cybersecurity, you need IT background, right? English proficiency requirement is also an issue, many questions arises. Here is the detailed requirement, okay. Uh, because our course is in English, and so there is a language requirement for else, uh, 6.5 overall, uh, with at least uh, 6.0 in each band. I think there are four bands in it. Okay. TOEFL, 92 overall, and uh, there is other things such as listening 21, speaking 23, and reading 22s, and writing 21, and so on. And uh, also there is another one, uh, Pearson Test of English or 62, that is all what you need to have. Okay, now if you have already had uh, uh, qualifications attended in Singapore or other English speaking countries, and then uh, uh, for at least the two years, uh, study in, in those English uh, medium or English as the official, uh, language of the course, then you can be exempted. Okay. So that's the language requirement and also application procedure. All the detailed procedures go to the website, you will basically see it. Before you go into that, perhaps you would like to prepare some of the document educational certificate. As we have just said, there are awards, there are bachelor degrees or whatever, those educational certificate and your passport or whatever other identity and uh, passport sized photographs of yourself. And then your CV and two reference letters. Okay. And then a little fee and the fees are so small. That's wonderful, of course. Okay. Right. Application closing date, very important. Make sure you catch at least the last train, otherwise you miss a year, right? 
for full-time master degree applications, uh, the deadline uh, for the local applicants is 6th of August this year. For international students, needs to be uh, uh, applicants is 2nd of July. That is the latest. Okay. Part-time, because there are different entry, so you will have different entry uh, deadlines. Okay. For May entry, that's 16th of April. July is 28th of May, September entry, 30th of July, November entry, 24th of September. Right. So in the end, hopefully you will join the congregations with the photos like this, with your pretty face on that for sure. And uh, you know what? Furthermore, you can expect after the graduation to be part of the globally renowned organization, play an important role uh, in, the, in, the, in the area, whatever it may be. And those are very big companies we have our alumni uh, with uh, people from our courses graduated have already joined those companies and play a very important and successful roles in them. okay and those are the companies countries uh, so uh, our program seem warwick student have already established uh, alumni group and they have been already in those countries okay uh, not entirely global but uh, it's a quite global already okay so uh, that's it i hope everybody get the message that you are in safe hand both sim and uh, warwick manufacturing group wmgs are world-renowned uh, institutions and our courses are well established and also uh, there is uh, evidence from uh, the graduates showing a very successful career yes. it is a very uh, uh, exciting course to take and, uh, a great deal to hope for Yes, it is definitely a very interesting and exciting course to venture into, especially after the masterclass. I think I myself am a little tempted to sign up for it as well. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, so I hope everyone enjoyed the masterclass. So thank you for spending your Thursday evening with us. If let's say you have any further questions, uh, feel free to write in to us via email or call us in via our inquiry hotline. If not, uh, thank you everyone and have a great evening. We'll be ending the session shortly. Okay. Thank you, Ash. Okay. okay, thank you, everybody. And best thank wishes you, Dr. Lou for as your well. call. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. Best wishes to you as well. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Bye.